a Korean American woman whose title is NFL analyst. This Seahawks pass rush is getting less pressure than a motel shower head right now. You know, I don't, I don't want to be inhibited by people watching this who think, who's she? Who does she think she is? Pittsburgh Death Star is really not that impressive on offense. Let's talk about how you became a sports analyst. So I love sports through my father. Never thought I would work in sports. Colin Kaepernick kneeling to draw attention to police brutality and racism. And this was not the biggest sports story of the year. It was honestly one of the biggest stories of the year. Mina Kimes, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Now, is this going to be a controversial conversation? Or are you going to make uh, the wrong choices when I ask you about the best of all time? Or are we going to get along? Uh, well, it depends whether or not you are right and appreciate LeBron James and everything that he's done for the sport of basketball. So I guess we'll find out. Obviously, the Celtics were playing for next year. We've been saying that for a while. They weren't going to win <laughs> this season. Everything that happened this season was gravy after Gordon Hayward. Love the NBA. And we cover it a lot. So in addition to being an NFL analyst, I'm on other shows we do, like Around the Horn, Highly Questionable, First Take, where we talk a lot of college football and NBA as well. Um, and, and not having a team like I do in Seattle actually makes it easier for me because I can just appreciate the game, root for the best matchups. Um, I love LeBron. If you're going to go to the GOAT conversation with me, it's LeBron. Feel free to... Bring on you're, you're, the hate you're gonna say if you Le don't agree. LeBron over Michael Jordan? Yeah, I'm, I'm a LeBron person. I think Michael Jordan clearly was better. Andrew, but you never watched Jordan at all. That's what you're saying. It, look, it, it's an era's thing. Obviously, basketball is so different now. Uh, we all watched The Last Dance. Some of those guys that MJ was banging around with, you would not see in the NBA today. The competition was very different, uh, in particular in the East. You definitely are on LeBron's payroll. All right, we're going to move on from that. You're definitely on LeBron's payroll. Slow your roll, okay? Because uh, <laughs> it's one thing for us plebes to come out and compare him to LeBron. And it is November. This hype train is only going to take on more passengers between now and March Madness. Talk a little bit about the female dynamic right now because we're seeing more, uh, I remember growing up and there weren't that many. Um, I probably could count uh, the number of folks on one hand. Uh, but today I actually feel like there is a broadening of the sports broadcaster role. Gender is one of the dimensions in which it's true, but I also see that racially, uh, that it feels like it's gone beyond white and black and you see uh, more and different in a variety of ways. I also feel like people are coming from different backgrounds. Um, you know, you talked about being an investigative journalist and business reporter, and I see more people who are coming maybe from uh, unusual places. Um, it's getting there. <laughs> I think, you know, in some ways, definitely. I mean, look, I am a Korean American woman whose title is NFL analyst. When I'm not on my show, the person who's on in my spot is Keyshawn Johnson. That's insane. I wish I could build a time machine and go back and tell my younger self, you're gonna be, you and Keyshawn Johnson are gonna be sitting in the same spot at that table, uh, breaking down games and, and stuff. So in some ways, I think it's so amazing to turn on ESPN and see women in particular for me, you know, like our network, I think has done a really good job what did you think when uh, Jamel Hill, who was another uh, female sports writer who became a broadcaster and was the host of one of ESPN's shows and then um, uh, spoke out against uh, President Trump and ultimately separated with the network? Do you still stand by what you said? And do you think that President Trump's supporters are white supremacists? Uh, I still stand by what I said. That was pretty public. What did you think? What did you see? What did other of your fellow colleagues think about while that was going down? Well, I should say I'm friends with Jamel, and I think she's awesome. And she's one of, when I talked about how our network, like, you know, you see women in roles that they weren't in uh, five years ago, five years ago. That's because of people like her. Not only cares deeply about things that are happening in the world, but uses her platform and continues to now, and I mean, many platforms she has, to express those views. Um, I look up to her. You remember the Bucks boycotting a game after the shooting of Jacob Blake in the wake of the death of George Floyd. And a lot of us at the network thought about, okay, some of our viewers or readers or listeners, they're 
maybe they're tuning in expecting one thing, but I feel I feel passionate about this. I want to talk about this through the lens of sports. How can I best accomplish that? In talking about sports, it matters also to be attuned to things that are happening in the world and how they affect athletes. And I think I'm always trying to find the right spots to do that. Colin Kaepernick kneeling to draw attention to police brutality and racism. And then you just can't dispute the fact that this was not the biggest sports story of the year. It was honestly one of the biggest stories of the year across the country. Athletes, analysts, reporters, engaging with the ways in which politics, issues of race and class affect sports more than ever, frankly. People feel empowered. I, I know you saw that with athletes, in particular college athletes who are so brave. Minds are more open now and people are speaking up more. This might be the most specific, powerful, impactful statement I have ever seen from an American sports team. The you've been dreaming about this car since you were eight policy from American Family Insurance. Talk about race because it feels like you probably have a, a, a really interesting purview. You know, for one, you've lived in a variety of different places. Two, you come from a blending of, of cultures. You know, three, you live in a place now like Los Angeles. And four, you're in the world of sports. What, if anything, have you learned or has surprised you on the question of race? And I realize that's a pretty big and open-ended question, but to some extent, I mean it to be. Has there been anything that has been a, a surprising revelation or insight? I mean, I cover a sport that is primarily black. This summer, you know, talking about as, as the protests were going on and so many teams and athletes and coaches and whatnot, coming forward and, and talking about systemic racism, right? You, you heard that phrase. Every team put out a statement, we're against systemic racism. To answer your question, until I started covering sports, I wasn't engaging with the ways in which issues of race actually affect the sports themselves. Ways in which black quarterbacks have been treated differently from white quarterbacks throughout time, coaches as well, frankly covering this league, covering the sport, doing, you know, X's and O's analysis. I've also um, been exposed to some of those problems and I see them dovetailing in ways that I, um, you know, I, I think part of my job is connecting those dots and being honest and open and critical when necessary. How much pushback have you gotten in from your reporting, whether you're touching matters of race or just an individual player? Yeah, I, I've definitely gotten um, pushback. You know, if I go on TV and I say it's crazy that this is a league that's over 70% black and yet we have four non-white head coaches, um, I get my phone definitely lights up a little bit. You know, these conversations don't make people comfortable. Um, there are, and then on social media, of course, there's parts of our audience or viewers who are interested and, and open to learning. And then there are people who don't want to hear those things, you know? If you were giving advice uh, to a younger Mina about dreaming fearlessly and bringing those dreams alive, what would you go back and tell her? What do you tell people about how to dream fearlessly and bring those dreams alive? I would tell my younger self, I think, um, one, your braces are going to come off at some point, I promise, and you'll look like a human being again, um, to care less about the opinions of others, which is frankly advice I still have to give myself today. And I think the number one thing I, I tell people when they ask me about doing my job and the trolls and how difficult it is, I, you know, I can't imagine like, I, I know obviously I have a bigger audience than the average 13 year old uh, and I'm getting more feedback on the internet, but we now all live in a time where we're constantly um, bombarded with the opinions of other people and feedback and we see it. And I think that's so difficult and challenging and um, requires mental 
strategies. You know, it, like living on the internet right now is not something that comes naturally to anyone. So I would tell me younger self, granted, it wasn't on. You know, Facebook didn't exist, but I would say don't worry so much about what other people think of you, and take more risks. Think about、um, careers and fields and opportunities. I suppose that are not. Something you're even imagining.、Um, like I said to you, I didn't. My job didn't occur to me for a really long time because it wasn't a job that I saw other women doing.、Um, I hope now, you know. I hope now younger women see that we're in these roles and that it's an opportunity that exists for them. But I also hope they're dreaming bigger than they're not just saying I want to be an NFL analyst. They're saying. I want to be, you know, an, a color commentator on Sunday Night Football or something, which no woman is doing. But I hope girls now are they're able to envision those possibilities, even though they don't exist. Let's talk about how you became、uh, a sports analyst. How did you enter that? If I had met you as a young person, were you like predestined to?、Uh, To end up there, so I love sports through my father. As I said, I inherited all of his interests. Love watching football with him, but never thought I would work in sports. Never, certainly never thought I would be on TV talking about sports. And、um, I was interested in writing, so I became a journalist out of college. And I was a business journalist for years before ESPN hired me. I、uh, was an investigative reporter at Fortune magazine and then Bloomberg News, and writing about. Business is doing bad things. All, all the while, my hobby was just watching an, you know, upsetting amount of football. But that was just my hobby until I started working at ESPN. Can they go nine and seven? Can they go eight and eight? Frankly, is, is a reasonable question as well. I kind of think they can, but I want to hear what you guys think first. And then, and how did the ESPN? How did the big break come?、Um, I wrote a personal essay about watching football with my father and. Sort of how it connected us, and I also, despite being a ostensibly serious financial journalist, all of my social media was just dumb football content, like commentary, memes on football. So, Sony ESPN saw both of those things, editor, and reached out to me and said, "You are writing about business, but you seem to be obsessed with football. Is this something you'd consider?"、Um, so, kind of made the quarter life jump.、Uh, Switched fields, and I joined ESPN as a writer, not an analyst, as a writer in 2014. You not see those numbers? This Seahawks pass rush is getting less pressure than a motel showerhead. <laughs> Much like when I was young, watching football, it didn't even occur to me, frankly,、um, that I would be on television, except for to talk about my stories sometimes. But I never thought I would be an analyst. Never thought I would do radio or TV or podcasts or any of that. I just thought I was going to be a reporter, and I was for first few years that I was at ESPN.、Uh, was writing profiles and covering the Olympics and that kind of thing.、Um, I didn't really start doing television full time until around 2016, 2017. Okay, but when you look at these <laughs> depth charts and compare them、uh, in Cleveland and Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh's depth chart is really not that impressive on offense. Has it been hard、uh, doing TV? Is it? What's it been like for you? Um, yeah, because I'm I'm not you know the kid who grows up with her hairbrush, looking at the mirror, pretending like she's doing broadcasts. I I didn't perform in college or anything like that,、um, and I never really wanted to be a public person in any way. You know, I loved talking about football. So for me, I've had to learn, you know, watching football, analyzing it, studying—that's stuff I know how to do. What I've had to learn is the performance side of it. You know, you're on television. You're how do you convey a complicated thought in 30 seconds? How do you make analysis or statistics, which is something I lean on a lot,、um, digestible to our viewers and interesting? And that's something that I've spent a lot of time working on. They need to show themselves that they can get enough offense. To go into the postseason with a Super Bowl caliber defense and win games. Have there been certain things that you have done over the last couple of years that have allowed you to become as good on TV as you are? Thank you.、Um, just practice. It's it's like writing. It's like any. It's craft. You know,、uh, gaining that sort of confidence came with time.、Um, 
I also work with a lot of really supportive, incredible people at ESPN. I mean, I alluded to the fact that I'm on this show with two former football players, my fellow analysts, hosted by Laura Rutledge, is fantastic, and they've been incredible advocates for me. You know, you asked about imposter syndrome. I doubt myself all the time, but I work with people who don't doubt me and who lift me up and affirm me, and, and um, I think that's so important when you're in this kind of job. Go route to DK Metcalf on fourth down. I get emotional just thinking about it. If they can keep <laughs> this up, this is going to be one of the best offenses in the NFL. Talk to me about the coach-player dynamic, because so many of the coaches have never played themselves, or at least never played it at an elite level, right? They weren't uh, NFL players. But what have you seen in that dynamic between coach and player, particularly those coaches who haven't played pro football or pro baseball or pro basketball, or in many cases, even college at an elite level? You know, I have spoken with a lot of athletes about this, about the coaches and sort of what it takes for them to love a coach, to respect a coach. And many NFL players in particular have told me, you know, I do appreciate it when a guy played, um, when, you know, when he's been through what I've been through. But you hear players talk about like a Bill Belichick who did not play football at a high level, but is obviously universally regarded as, I think, the greatest NFL coach in the history of the sport. And I've talked to former players of his who have said, Obviously, they respect his mind, his brilliance, his appreciation, his, you know, uh, grasp of the game, all of the work that he puts into it. But they feel like he goes out of his way to understand their role and what it takes. And, and that sort of I don't, empathy is the wrong word, but that sort of deep understanding doesn't necessarily require having played the game. And frankly, that's something I think about because I'm in a position where people come at me all the time and say, you didn't play the game. And I feel an additional pressure to, I guess, do the work, frankly, um, because I didn't. I, I'm not able to draw on my own playing experience, uh, but I can draw on a deep well of research and preparation. I think I just compared myself to Bill Belichick there, which I'd like to walk back, <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, I actually appreciate what you're saying. I appreciate that you walked it uh, back there. You know, but but stay with that for a little bit. I mean, do you feel like you have that real insight? I mean, so many of us love sports here in the U.S. and around the world. I have to both compartmentalize it so that it doesn't inhibit um, sort of my ability to be expressive and opinionated and be myself. You know, I don't, I don't want to be inhibited by this sense that whether well, a lot of people watching this who think, who's she? Who does she think she is? These guys, you know, they've gone through the stereotypes. Chris Stapps, we all remember, was booed at the draft. They're rooting for him to change those perceptions and sort of continue on the path that they've cleared for him. I think it's also important for me to be aware of the gaps in my knowledge. You know, I do an NFL show um, where the two other analysts who are on with me are former players. And when we, when a story comes up, where I do feel like playing experience matters, I take a step back and I ask them because I want to learn from them. Thank you. Yeah, it kind of sounds like I needed a nap there or something, <laughs> maybe drank too many Red Bulls. The importance of doing television or analysis as a team is recognizing much like a, you know, actual sports team, who brings what strengths and weaknesses to the table and being cognizant of those while not letting them weigh you down as I think sometimes when were underrepresented folks in certain fields, that feeling can weigh you down and you don't want it to do that. Hey, talk to me a little bit, Mina, about some of uh, your hobbies. Uh, word has it that uh, you're a little bit of a crossword junkie. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, I'm so cool that my number one hobby is doing crosswords, uh, but only Thursday, Friday, Saturday. <laughs> Oh, and do you only do the New York Times or are there other, is there like a more sophisticated level or a tougher no, no, level I of competition? No, I only do the New York Times. I, do, I have the New York Times app. I got into it um, when I start, a few years ago when I started traveling for work and doing television in Miami. My dream is to have my name in the New York Times crossword. That's when I know, I'll know that I've made it. All right, I'm gonna have you do a little rapid fire. Are you ready for okay. rapid fire? Yes. Yep. 
Uh, your favorite book? Oh my gosh. Uh, House of Mirth. House of Mirth, nice choice. Um, who would you love to meet who you haven't met yet? Um, this is really, so I met Marshawn Lynch, but I was too nervous to say anything. So I'd like to, I was in Hawaii, this is the weird, I was in Hawaii, I know you said rapid fire, but I was in Hawaii doing color commentary for a Rams game with my friend Reese Jones Drew, just dropped like a bunch of names, and he was like, hey Marshawn! And the whole time I was like, and then he walked away and MJD was like, why don't you just talk to him, you weirdo? And I was like, he's Marshawn Lynch, he's like my favorite. So I would like a chance to re-meet Marshawn. Uh, most impressive athlete you've ever seen or covered, just like in terms of pure athletic talent, you're like that person, whether or not they're the GOAT, just in terms of talent, like that's top tier talent. Simone Biles. Uh, I did the, uh, the Olympics in Rio, so I got to see her perf uh, compete in person. And uh, just, I, I think she's probably gonna go down as the most dominant gymnast in the history of the sport. She already is. Uh, but I think she's like the most probably dominant athlete, period, I've ever seen. Who's the, uh, um, what is the most interesting interview on your podcast you've had so far? Oh, so yeah, my show, Mina Khan Show featuring Lenny, um, co-hosted by my dog. <laughs> Mostly it's just analysis, but I've done a few interviews. Um, we have Bobby Wagner on from the Seahawks. I thought that was really interesting, so I'll point to him. He's an excellent player, interesting guy, uh, future Hall of Famer. You're making Bobby Wagner a future Hall of Famer? I am, I think he is. <laughs> He's, he has d dominated the position for several years, which is usually the bar. Uh, Mina, finish us up by talking to us about where, where you hope this all will go. I mean, no one knows for sure, and I'm sure part of you is just enjoying the journey, but if you do sit back sometimes and kind of think a little bit about what you'd love to be true over the next five to 10 years, do you have a vision for that right now about, about what would be great? So I've never had a five-year plan, and in some ways, I think that's served me well because my career has taken such a strange winding path to get where I am. Um, and I hope that in five years, I am doing something that I'm not even dreaming of right now. It's such a cop-out weird answer, but um, I hope it's something that transcends something that seems realistic to me at the moment. It kind of going back to what I said to you earlier about how I hope young women are envisioning themselves in roles that are not currently occupied by women. I, I'm not young anymore, but I feel the same way. I hope I'm doing something that uh, didn't seem realistic to me at the time. And I love football, so more likely than not, that will be in football, but I don't necessarily know exactly what it is. Mina, I, I love that. I really appreciate you, and I hope that you'll keep coming back to the show. By the time you come back next time, you will put Michael Jordan in his right place, uh, <laughs> rightful place. But, uh, but, but, but I really, I really appreciate you coming today. Thank you for, uh, thank you for stopping by. Thanks for having me. Hey, I hope you really enjoyed meeting Mina Kimes. I think she's a big, bright star. I went into this believing that she'll be the face of ESPN over the next three years, and I believe that even more smart, interesting, willing to grind, as she talked about. Uh, really loved kind of seeing that. And even that chip on her shoulder, kind of using the imposter syndrome to her advantage, I love that as well. Um, didn't you like the way she answered the question, where will she be in the next five years? Saying, I hope it's somewhere that I may not even imagine today. I love that. I hope we all can feel that way. Um, if you're enjoying this show, I hope you'll think about subscribing, maybe even tell a friend. And hey, why not listen to the whole thing? Enjoy the podcast. I'll see you soon. Hey, tune into The Carlos Watson Show. It's like no other. You're going to enjoy it every weekday on YouTube.